have you with us, whether you're watching us live uh, through our Facebook feed or the church website, or, or whether you're watching a recording of this um, later on. Uh, thank you for tuning in and, and being a part of our time together this morning. Here at the hall, um, you can probably hear the echo because uh, right here uh, with us right now, there's just myself, um, Andrew, who's running the uh, computers, and Alan, who will be speaking to us in a, in a short while. Um, uh, but uh, that's all that we are allowed to have while these restrictions are in place. Uh, we will keep you up to date with any changes to these restrictions as soon as they're available, um, but right now uh, this is what we are limited to. So please uh, thank you for your perseverance and patience. Hang in there. Uh, we will get through this and uh, we look forward to being able to come back together uh, and meet together again as we uh, want to do. Um, during our time together this morning, uh, we will be reading through uh, God's Word. If you have a Bible or you have a device where you can access um, the Bible, that would be great. Uh, we will be sharing the communion meal uh, at the end of our time together this morning. If you're prepared for that, uh, that would be fantastic. A little something to eat and something to drink uh, to, to do that. Just a couple of things to remind you of um, before we, we get into things. Um, the 24-7 prayer over Blacktown um, announcement from Tony Cowman and Greater West for Christ. Uh, we'll get information out to you on that uh, as soon as, as we can. Uh, we would love for people to be able to um, commit themselves to one hour uh, um, during the month of August, maybe for a week, maybe one hour every week. Uh, anyway, however you can do it, to come together and pray um, over Blacktown uh, so that somebody is in that space in Campbell Street 24-7, for the whole month of, of August. But it'll become clearer to you when we, when we can send that information out. But please be praying and thinking uh, into how you, you might be able to be involved in, um, in that. Um, it's been a very difficult uh, and challenging week for some um, and for others even more so. And uh, if you're unaware, uh, Darren uh, has not had a great week, Darren Kwan. Um, he was taken to hospital earlier in the week um, and uh, he was stabilised there uh, and, and sent home where he's more comfortable, um, but uh, it, it wasn't uh, an easy week for Darren, for Vanessa and Layla, uh, and for Steve and Sue and the rest of the family, and of course we'll be praying for them, uh, but please keep them in your prayers as we uh, move into uh, the, week, the week ahead. Um, I'm going to read from uh, Psalm 8, uh, and then I'll be um, leading us in our family prayer time. Uh, then there'll be our regular Bible reading, after which time Alan will come up to bring the message to us. So we're going to read Psalm 8 to the choir master, according to the Gitteth, a psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honour you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Please join with me as we pray together this morning. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendour of his holiness. Father God, we do indeed ascribe to you all glory, majesty, worship and power. You alone are worthy of such praise. You are our help, our wisdom. You are our salvation. 
and we do indeed praise your holy name. You are full of grace and mercy. You are our joy, even when we fail to see it. You gladden our hearts and our souls, and so we say thank you and we bless you forever. Father God, our constant confession is that we have fallen short of that glory, that even while your faithfulness is from everlasting to everlasting, even while your steadfast love endures for all eternity, we have made poor choices, listened to our own logic, or allowed our emotions to lead us into anger, pride, to justify our own actions. Forgive us, we pray, and lead us gently back beside those still waters where we see your goodness and grace and allow your Holy Spirit to minister, us, minister to us there. And so even as we benefit from the transforming work of your Spirit in our lives, we ascribe to you all glory and honour and thanks and praise. Father, our hope had been for a lifting of the restrictions which are having such an impact on so many in our community. You've answered our prayers by providing vaccines and now in your mercy give us patience and perseverance to endure these inconveniences and frustrations. Once again, Father God, we do thank you for our governments and for the way they have made decisions that have been difficult but that have saved so many lives. Help us once again, Father God, to see beyond the short-term challenges to the long-term benefits of these decisions. But we do pray particularly this morning for our Premier and her Cabinet as they continue to assess the situation in Sydney and we pray that her decisions will be fair, they'll be just and they will be for the good of all. We pray again for countries less fortunate than our own that there would be a fair distribution of vaccines to all nations and that those who have more would give more to those who have less. Give the leaders of those countries to our country, Father God, generous hearts that they may find joy in doing good. Father, many in our own community of faith find themselves dealing with difficulties and issues on top of the COVID restrictions. People who live with health problems over many, many uh, years in some cases. People who are grieving people who are worried and anxious over financial matters, work situations, relationships with family. Father, out of your abundance of grace and mercy, we pray for all of them, for healing, for peace, for comfort, for freedom to enjoy you in their lives, for a strengthening of their faith to enable them to endure and persevere no matter what they face in life. But Father, we do pray at this time, particularly for Darren Kwan, which has uh, this week, which has been such a difficult week for him. Uh, it is heartbreaking, Father God, for us to see this young man's life deteriorating this way. We're sorry, Father God, for uh, the fact that the uh, trials that he's been on haven't been as successful as, as we would have hoped. But we thank you, Father God, that there were these trials in the first place and we pray that the lessons learnt from Darren's experience will help someone else. But Father, that is little comfort at this time for Vanessa, for Layla, for Steve and Sue and the rest of the family. There's a comfort that only you can give, that only your spirit can provide. And so we pray, Father God, our desire, our heart's desire is that Darren would be healed, that Darren would, would be uh, the beneficiary of one of your miraculous interventions. And we know that you can do it. And while we pray your will be done, Father God, our heart's desire is that your will would conform with our desire to see Darren well. And so we pray, Father God, for our community as we, as we um, uphold Darren before you this morning. Um, thank you for those who, who pray continually. Ask you, Father God, to sustain us in this effort. Father, we pray for <coughs> Connie as she returns to Crawford and Doonside Public Schools to resume her scripture classes this term. Uh, we realise that it won't be this week because children are not going back to school. We're not sure when it will be. Uh, but we thank you, Father God, for the wonderful opportunity that we have to tell young people about Jesus 
in our schools. We pray your protection over this law. We pray for our friends in Cobus and ask you to give them a clear vision of their purpose and a plan as they return to high schools in and around Blacktown. We pray too for those who are involved in cross-cultural mission work throughout the world through so many organisations like Baptist World Aid, WEC, Global Interaction, MAF, Samaritan's Purse and so many others. We pray that even in this pandemic they would be finding ways to use this crisis as an opportunity to reach many with the love of Jesus. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as King forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. And Father, may the truth of this help us to constantly praise you and worship you. May the truth of this inspire us to repentance and to fruitful living. And may we indeed ascribe to you, our loving Father, all glory and honour, always. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to read our Bible reading this morning, which is taken from Acts chapter 8. Uh, we're reading verses 26 to 40. Uh, and I'm switching versions now to the NIV UK. Alan didn't ask me to, but I know he does like that particular version. Uh, so this is Acts chapter 8, 26 to 40, uh, the NIV UK version. Philip and the Ethiopian. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And this is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so did he not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told the good news about Jesus. As they travelled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptised? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptised him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and travelled about preaching the gospel in all the towns that he reached until he reached Caesarea. That's the word of God. It's good to have Alan here with us this morning. Looking forward to what he has to say. Thanks, Alan. Yes, thanks, Lee, and uh, good morning to you all. Uh, you're welcome. And uh, if you feel like leaving any comments for us uh, during the feed, please do so. We'll be happy to receive them. Just a reminder about after the talk, when we're going to share the communion together, uh, perhaps sometime during the next little while, you can find something to represent bread and wine uh, or juice so we can share together. In the book of Acts, Luke tells us about <coughs> an incident during Paul's second mission trip. This is Acts 19. <coughs> While Apollos was at Corinth, 
Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There are about 12 of them in all. There was a key question there in verse 2. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? A question I want you to think about today. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Was it in any way connected with baptism for faith in Jesus? Thanks to Lee for reading us about Philip's meeting with the Ethiopian eunuch on his way home from Jerusalem. After hearing the truth about Jesus, the traveller asked to be baptised in some convenient water. Afterwards, he resumed his journey rejoicing. Again, you may remember <coughs> excuse me, that wonderful scene at the end of Peter's outdoor sermon on the day of Pentecost, Max 2 verse 36. Peter went on, let all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptised and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000 baptised in one day. That must use a whole lot of water. As Baptists, we say, believers' baptism is not necessary for salvation, but is necessary for obedience. The examples we've looked at here show people being baptised very soon, we might even say immediately, after believing in Jesus. I love the time each year when we celebrate Pentecost, the time when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples after Jesus returned to heaven following his resurrection, fulfilling his promises. And after Pentecost, I often find myself being reminded of the wonderful work of God through his followers in the weeks and months following that time as recorded for us by Luke in Acts. These mighty manifestations of the Spirit's power fulfilled Jesus' promises, such as in John 16, 5 to 11. Jesus says to his disciples, but now I'm going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you're filled with grief because I've said these things. But very truly I tell you, it's for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he'll prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. And after his resurrection, in Matthew 28, 16 to 20, then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The promise of the Holy Spirit is reaffirmed during the days following Jesus' resurrection. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, Luke begins. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you'll be baptised with the Holy Spirit. Summing up Jesus' promise, promises during his time with them. I must go or the Holy Spirit will not come to you. You will receive power. Wait for the promise and the baptism in the Spirit and go into all the world with this saving message. Many of the movements forward with the Gospel of Jesus in Acts reflected Jesus' instructions. Go, teach, baptise. For example, we see the great crowd baptised in Acts 2. The Ethiopian eunuch, eunuch's question in the passage Lee read to us. And then there's Ananias' instructions to Paul. Acts, verse nine, uh, sorry, Acts chapter 9, verse 10. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias! Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he's seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I'll show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptised and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Have you turned to Jesus? Has he saved you from your sins? Is he your saviour? Have you been baptised in water since believing? I can't point to any water near here, as the eunuch did, but I can ask, what's stopping you from being baptised? Speak to me or one of the church leaders. It'll be our joy to find the water and a time soon. There'll be joy for you and us, just as the outcome of his baptism brought joy for the eunuch. Left to ourselves, we cannot turn to God in repentance and seek salvation. We need the Spirit to revive our dead hearts and show us our need for Christ's salvation, to bring about repentance and a desire to be forgiven. As with the huge crowd on the day of Pentecost, ready to turn to Christ at the end of Peter's sermon. It is by grace that we are saved, moved towards God by the call of the Spirit, and then, who then becomes the seal of our entry into God's family. Throughout Acts, we read re how the Spirit continues his radical work of changing believers into the likeness of Christ. 
For example, in Acts 2, soon after the mass baptism on the day of Pentecost, my Bible has the heading, The Fellowship of Believers, Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. Everyone was filled with awe and the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. The Spirit is about changing attitudes, enlarging love for the fellowship of believers and needy persons, forming communities of believers devoted to understanding and sharing the good news about Jesus. The promises of Jesus for empowerment in the Spirit to his disciples are evidently intended as the experience of all believers in Acts. And the New Testament epistles frequently speak about the work of the Spirit in believers to make us fruitful in discipleship. For example, in Ephesians 2, beginning at verse 1, Paul says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace You have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The Holy Spirit's ministry in believers is giving gifts to men and women for works of service that God prepared in advance for us to do. Again, in 1 Corinthians 12, by God's grace, the Spirit distributes gifts to every believer for the good of the body of believers, starting at verse 1. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. Verse 3, therefore I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them, in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Peter says, every one of us, should use the gift or gifts we've received by the Spirit to serve others. 1 Peter 4 verse 8. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. 
offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very word of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power for ever and ever. Amen. It's great to see people who've joined the Fellowship of Believers here in Westview exercising the gifts that the Spirit has given them, using their gifts and glorifying God. Just as in the early days of the church, the outworking of the joy of the fellowship was evident right from the start. Acts chapter 2 again, verse 42. The new Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Jesus gave his disciples a radical realignment of their attitude to serving. We remember his discussion about greatness and servanthood in Luke 24, verse 24. A dispute also arose among them, that is the disciples, as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But, said Jesus, I am among you as one who serves. Bruce Milne makes this comment. Jesus taught that greatness was to be found in humble service. This radically changes our attitudes today as it did those of the disciples. Service is not the pathway or preliminary to greatness. It is greatness. Behind this lies the ministry of Jesus himself. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. The servant Messiah calls the church to identify, him, identify with him in the servant community, meaning that Fulfilment in life lies immediately to hand in humble service of one another. God gives us gifts with which to, ho to honour him by serving in his body. I feel like the Holy Spirit has used the new church paradigm and Jesus the Game Changer series to stir us up with a fresh vision for the life of this church and contribution and our contribution to its life as Christians in our own communities. <clears throat> this has certainly been evident in the discussions in the Wednesday GPS, at least. I've been shown a leaflet prepared by one of the churches in Blacktown City that aims to encourage everyone in their fellowship to use their gifts in ministry. This is how it begins. We all have a part to play. Like a body, each part is vital and does its bit for the good of the whole. May it be a joy for you to not just come to church, but to make a positive contribution that together we're working for the cause of the gospel as God builds his church. May it help you connect with others and use your God-given gifts as part of a team. The leaflet then gives a long list of many opportunities that the church has identified for its people to use their giftedness. Some of them might surprise you. 
We're thankful for so many who are giving themselves to supporting this fellowship and reaching out into our part of the great city of Blacktown for those who have discovered their gifts. I suspect there are others who want to serve Christ, to be gifted for service, but so far haven't ventured into the water, as it were. As we've read, every believer is gifted by the Holy Spirit. Do you believe God has gifted you in a certain way? How might you act on that? Do you see particular gifts in other people that they could be using? How could you encourage them? Are you unsure of your gift or gifts? Do you wonder how God has blessed you in this way? What could you do next? If you're stuck, unconvinced, don't wait to be asked. There are many opportunities for service within the church, but also beyond our walls, even in lockdown. You can get beyond your wall through your computer anyway. Talk to one another. Ask in your GPS. Speak to a leader. Pray for opportunities. When an opportunity to serve attracts you but you feel ungifted, pray. Ask for training. Do something different. Who knows? It might encourage others. Be the start of a new ministry in the church. If you just really don't know, ask a friend, pray together. The gifts are given to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. That's from Ephesians chapter 4. As we use the Spirit's gifts, we are helping the body grow in unity and fellowship, all of us. The Holy Spirit is not bound by our limitations. He will build his church and the gates of hell can't ever overcome it. Thanks be to God. We're about to share the communion of the Lord's Supper. This is the time to get your bread and juice ready for that celebration. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks for bread and wine. Lord Jesus, we come to you in need of your salvation. We thank you that you gave your body and gave your blood so that we might live. Blessed be your name, our Father, for providing for our salvation. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done. Thank you, Spirit, for helping us to understand the wonder of redemption. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, said Jesus. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. 
when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Save us, Saviour of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Just want to say thank you to all of you who've joined us, those who are here, Lee and Andrew, for their help. Thank the Lord for the internet. If you want to leave a message on the, on the feed, please feel free to do so. And now a blessing. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you for being with us. Good morning.